Hey everybody, so I am here with Dr. Sarah Haig, and uh, just a quick shout out to anyone who's gonna be watching this live. If you do have any questions or anything like that, you can type it out and we will see it scroll up, I think, and I hope, um, as we go through the podcast. Um, so thank you for watching, if you're watching live, or even if you're watching on the replay, we appreciate it. And we'll get the podcast started in a second. Yeah, and also thank you to everyone who came. I think, yes. <laughs> I'd like to, and, and be prepared to ask questions. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the, re so I hit the record button and you know how it goes. And if you say anything and you feel like you wanna take it out, we can take it out of here, but we can't take it out of there. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, it it's, on the internet Got it. it's on the internet forever. All right. Okay. All right, sit. Sarah, I was gonna say Dr. Sarah Haig. It just feels <laughs> weird because we've known each other forever. But forever. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about pelvic health for the non-pelvic health PT. Yes. So there are a lot of physical therapists who I think are interested in pelvic health, but maybe they don't want to like dive in literally and figuratively. <laughs> so That's true. I want what we're gonna do today is talk about how we as physical therapists can treat people with pelvic conditions and with pelvic issues without necessarily doing internal work. Is that fair? That's definitely fair. Okay. And, and I would say even one more thing than that is just the, um, the fact that we can't skip the middle, right? So like the, the functions of the pelvis, really important. Bowel and bladder health, right? I mean, very important for survival. Sex, very important for quality of life and propagation of the species. So these are all things that matter but also, when people come in with low back pain, when people come in with hip pain, I always find it very interesting that people say, but I don't do the pelvis. You know, the pelvic floor is the only musculoskeletal structure we're not trained in most programs to palpate or to touch. It's just skeletal muscle. That's all we're assessing for really is pelvic floor PTs. Um, so I just think it's interesting. It's like a, it's like a blurry void when you're looking at like a body <laughs> diagram. Like, oh, uh, oh, there's your knee, okay. So yeah, so it's really important, I think, to understand what's there and you don't have to go there but you have to know it's there and know that some people need help there and help them find the help. So if someone let's take this person that has low back pain because mm -hmm. that's a I think a diagnosis that we can all agree that we see on a regular basis. So what are a couple of questions you can ask during your initial evaluation so the subjective part of the initial evaluation that perhaps a lot of people are missing or that can take in that pelvic health, er the pelvic area? There's a couple of ways that you can kind of like cheat your way in where you don't even have to think about what to ask to begin with. If you have a red flag questionnaire, there is a ball and bladder question on there. So, and it's, it's really interesting because people will sometimes circle yes on those and then never discuss it. <laughs> like, wait a second, <laughs> we asked the question, they said, yes, it's a thing. Um, so there's your end. It's like, I noticed you, you marked yes on the bowel and bladder changes. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Most of the time, it is not truly a red flag. Most of the time, it is not a sign they need to be referred to a physician or the ER. Most of the time, it's like, huh, no one's ever asked me that. Yeah, stuff is different. There's your end. Okay. Um, and then also, if you use the classic oswestry, so it was modified, I think, in 2001 or 2002 to take off a sex questionnaire. Um, and uh, or the sex question of the questionnaire and it was revalidated and all of those things but if you use the original one it's pretty awesome because now they're like huh nobody's asked me about sex and then you are be like ah I see that this is an issue can you tell me more mm -hmm. because my one of my favorite Twitter stories when I get a direct message from someone asking me about a patient who was having pain with intercourse and I was like thanks for reaching out absolutely can you tell me more about when they're having trouble and where it hurts would you like to know where it hurt their knees in one particular position <laughs> and I said fantastic you can help with that <laughs> so so it, it's not always it might be a sex problem but it's not necessarily <laughs> a pelvic, pelvic problem. Floor problem so we have to not be shy about asking those okay um, another one if we're going to low back pain so low back pain is like the most expensive healthcare problem we have in mm -hmm. terms of multi-billion um, dollar problem billions and billions worldwide and so of course addressing back pain it's we're still working on the best way to do that but a lot, there's, um, there's a high prevalence of urinary incontinence in people who have low back pain. So if you're seeing people who have low back pain, and after, if anyone else went to the pregnancy talk this morning, um, after vaginal deliveries, 
the prevalence of incontinence goes way up. Goes way up. So if you're seeing someone with back pain, someone who's had babies, all you can, you, what you can do is you can be like, well, I see this in your history because that's pertinent history for back pain, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's like, hey, I noticed this. Any issues with this? And here's the reason I'm asking. Because you can't just go, do you pee your pants? Because people are like, do I smell? Like, what happened? Like, <laughs> so if you're just like, you know, there is a really high prevalence and the nurse when you're back, go to your pelvis and all of these things. So I'd be really curious to know, are you having any issues in this area? Because there's help if you are. And then kind of go from there. And I want to backtrack for just a second. When you were talking about red flags, and you said some are truly red flags and some aren't. Mm -hmm. So just so that uh, we're all on the same page, what would be those truly red flags? A truly, like in, in the pelvic world or in the entire rest of your body world, is any um, unintentional weight loss or weight gain, 10 or 15 pounds over a short period of time, mm -hmm. um, also like fever, like temperature issues, loss, loss of appetite, when you have those other constitutional mm -hmm. um, symptoms that go along with it. Mm -hmm. So just having some perkiness with your bowel and bladder it's really no reason to panic. But okay. if you have also a fever and also a recent traumatic event, okay. nah, now we wanna just make sure everything's okay. And the cool thing is, is that if you go to the doctor and it's like, you don't have a UTI, everything else is looking fine. Awesome, then I can help with that. Got it. But yeah, but the red flags, um, they, there's been a couple of great papers that have come out where it's like, it's not like, if you have pain at night, freak out. No, no. If nope. you have pain at night, but also a sudden bowel and bladder change and also Okay, now we need to check in for yeah. it, but don't panic. Yeah. It's still the only one. Okay, and now, if let's say you're using these questionnaires and someone puts on bowel bladder or someone circles sex um, as something that they're having difficulty with. Mm -hmm. And I love this question because this was something that was brought up last year at CSM. So there was a, a physical therapist there who said, well, I live in the South. And these are not easy questions to ask because people are more conservative or they don't want to talk openly about their bowel and bladder issues or about sex with their partners and so what do you say to those people those therapists that um, are dealing with a population that's maybe much more conservative and they they're not sure how to approach those subject matters um, I always say just always with kindness and good intention and with a good explanation so you can't not do it because it's awkward for you you should be asking for a medical reason right so quality of life is in our wheelhouse right like we're doing all sorts of quality of life questionnaires um, peeing your pants is a huge detriment for your quality of life in many cases not being able to have sex can impact your relationship with your partner your feelings of ability to even have a partner, having babies, all of these things that end up being huge stresses, which is gonna make a lot of other things not as good either. Um, so so just start simple. If they're, if you're asking questions, so if someone comes in with like straightforward knee pain, do I'm like, how sex? No, that's not how, <laughs> that's not where we go with that. But if, if someone's coming in with low back or pelvic issues, the way I usually approach it is to bring it up anatomically, right? So all right, so this is the anatomy. These are where the muscles go. Most people don't think about them, except that when they're, if they're having issues like incontinence or have had babies. Those pelvic floor muscles are muscles like everything else we're gonna work in PT. So I'm gonna ask you some questions and I just, and try to do it in a spot where you have some privacy. I know some PT places, you're like in the middle of a gym. If you can find a quiet corner, do everything you can to put them at ease. But just to be like, this is why I'm asking. And if they're like, mm, if you can see that resistance, be like, all right, like it's not necessarily the number one priority for this treatment anyway, but if those things happen to be issues, there is help, it can get better, and you just let me know if you have any questions. Because um, not everybody wants to talk about it, and it's not my job to convince you to deal with it, it's my job to help you if you want help. Right, and if you're a physical therapist that isn't specializing in pelvic health, it's a little bit different because if you're specializing in pelvic health and people are going to you because you specialize in pelvic it's way health, easier. you know these questions are going to come up. But for those of us who don't specialize in pelvic health, then those questions can be a little bit more sensitive. So I just wanted yeah. you to kind of to make that distinction there for people. Yeah, and then, and also if you, if you're going to ask, so if you're going to take that step and be like, all right, I'm going to ask about the incontinence. I mean, because sometimes.
sometimes you're in situations where it is an obvious issue. Other times it's like, well, based on their history, they're actually at risk for it. Um, then you can talk prevention, which is always kind of fun. But, um, but yeah, just if they give you some information, especially if you got up the guts to ask them, then please, please do something with it. Don't just be like, oh yeah, so great, incontinence, noted in the chart, we'll put it on the diagnosis list. Like, have a plan. And there are some things you can do without doing a pelvic floor exam that can make amazing changes. Like what? Well, actually, before we even get to what you can do without even having the pelvic exam, what, um, how can we sort of palpate or, or evaluate pelvic floor muscles without having to go internally? I think that's a question everybody wants to know, right? Great question. Um, so, uh, so, I'll be honest, some people don't want you to touch in there, like full stop. And so I will actually give people, I would say it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. So we can actually, we could all check our own pelvic floor muscles right here. And, um, you know, I would basically talk you through it. You would tell me what you felt. I'd keep an eye on everything else to see what else you were doing. But I would be very honest that my assessment is going to be, I believe you, it seems you're doing it correctly. Right, so, but I have to believe you. But you can actually palpate externally. Um, as a clinician, you can actually do it, and you can do it in sideline, you can do it in hook line. Um, some people will do it in prone. I'm not a super big fan because I can't see their faces. Mm -hmm. um, and also it can be kind of a vulnerable position. Um, so, mm -hmm. and basically if you just palpate, if you find the ischial tuberosity, so imagine you have two ischial tuberosities. Imagine that yeah, there's I'll a, move over so oh. <laughs> So imagine, so we have our ischial tuberosities. You know about where the anal sphincters are. Okay. There's normal human variation, so I always say move slow and make sure you're asking for feedback. But you know midline is where the sphincters are going to be. We're not going midline. So you just kind of find that ischial tuberosity and like palpate your way around to the medial part of it. And that's where the pelvic floor attaches. So then you can kind of talk them through, like I'd like you to squeeze, and there's a bunch of different cues. One of the most common cues, especially for the back end, is to like squeeze like you don't want to pass gas. That's awesome. But if your main problem is urinary incontinence, that's the back, set, back side, not the front side. So how do we get it up there? So another cue that has been found to be very helpful, it's only been studied in men, but it is uh, shorten your penis. But what's interesting is ladies, I know we don't have them, <laughs> right? Imagine that feeling, right? So like, just imagine like pulling in, like, like right? It totally changed where, well, hopefully, if this was a class, I would have asked, where did you feel it? But like, it, it changes it from the back and biases it towards the front of it. So find a cue that gets them to go, oh my god, I felt something. And you're like, awesome. So if you're doing a Kegel and like this happens, you're probably not doing it right. If like that's happening, you're probably not doing it right. But if like I'm Kegeling now and then I let go, you shouldn't have seen me get taller or tenser or breathe funny. Um, it should be very... And then, yeah. so as you're palpating on the medial side of the ischial tuberosities, you're feeling for um, those muscles to contract? Yeah, so it's kind of like a gentle bulge, and you can totally feel this on yourself here if you're comfy or somewhere else. <laughs> but when you feel it, it's almost like when you're feeling like, um, like if, if you have your bicep slightly bent and you kind of like contract and it kind of, you feel it tensioning and like a little bit of a bulge, that's what you're feeling for. Um, but it can always be tricky because I use the word bulge. Some people will have people push down. So you should also be able to like relax your pelvic floor, push down, like having a bowel movement. Um, that shouldn't happen when you're trying to contract. So like when I say bulge, you're, you should feel like a gathering of the muscle. That's what you're feeling. If you feel your fingers get pushed down in a way, they're doing the opposite of a contraction. So they're, they're relaxing instead of, or are they, like what, what, do you, what is the opposite of a contraction? In that um, sense. It would kind of depend on what they were doing and the cues you were giving. So mm -hmm. it could just be like I'm pushing down like doing a Valsalva. Okay. But it is basically a lengthening of the pelvic floor. Okay. I, I don't know if it's always a relaxation, so to speak, but okay. it's kind of lengthening. Yeah. Okay. And what is the the difference between that sort of Valsalva lengthening and that small bulge? Like why is that significant? Ah. When you feel it, you'll know. Um, it's significant because if they're pushing down in a way, that's not a contraction. So if you're going for strengthening or more closure to hold things in, yeah. you want that kind of like tensioning and bulge. But if you're like, Ugh, actually the problem's constipation, I can't get things out, you want them to be able to like relax and lengthen. Got it.
Okay, all right. So now we know how we can kind of feel our pelvic floor muscles without having to do an internal exam. So as uh, once you once you figure out and kind of what you said sort of leads right into the next into the next question is if you are if you have someone that's coming in with incontinence and you are looking for that that sort of tightening or, or gathering up of the muscle, which I think that's a nice cue for people to understand, because bulge can yeah can sometimes be a little confusing for people. Right, yeah. But I like that you're feeling the gathering of that musculature. Is that something that you are then going to add into a home exercise program? Or like once you find that the pelvic floor muscle is working or it's not working, what, what next, what do you do? Well, so I'll be honest, it's always, I like it when people are brave enough and the patients are brave enough to be like, sure, you can have a feel, <laughs> like, let's, let's figure this muscle thing out. Um, I usually try, in, in a normal, I just came up, in a normal setting, so not a pelvic one, no, pelvic settings are normal too, but in like, just a normal, like say outpatient mm -hmm. therapy, be it orthopedics or neuro, I would actually have them ask more questions about incontinence before even checking the pelvic floor muscles. Okay. Uh, because the ty different types of incontinence are going to kind of tell you a little bit more about what you should do. So some people have incontinence when they try to go from sit to stand, or when they cough, or when they go running. So I want to know a little bit more about when is it happening. Because if it's only ever when you're putting your key in the front door, or when you're running into the bathroom, that's more urgent incontinence. Would pelvic floor muscle exercises help? Maybe. But also probably looking at at their overall bladder health, which is where a voiding log would come in very handy. And actually, uh, shout out to the home health section, they have an incontinence, a urinary incontinence toolkit. It's it's free for members for sure, but I think it might be free for everyone. Do you know? Uh, I think it was $5. Yeah, or it's not very small. So yeah. it's a PDF with actually, like it talks you through the different types of incontinence. Because one of the, so the most common form of incontinence is urge incontinence, which is and like, so, what, what was that? I was gonna say, and that is. Oh, <laughs> is, is, is kind of that, um, there's like, you're, you're, usually your urge incontinence is preceded by a strong urge to go. So this is one of those things where, so there's a bathroom at the end of the hall. So if you're like, I'm totally fine, but then your eyes wander, you're like, oh, I could go. Mm. And I didn't have to go, and then I would get up to go, and I got to the bathroom, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, where did that come from? Like all of a sudden it felt like your kidneys just were like, did a dump, did, but, a, did, did, a, did a big dump. Yeah. But they don't, that's not how kidneys work. It's just how it feels to you. So what that really is, is your detrusor muscle kind of going, ah, I'm so excited. I imagine a puppy, like, have you ever like gone to let a puppy out the door? Like, so they're like, hey, I wanna go out and you get up and you make a move for that door and they're like, ah, so excited. Your bladder's like that sometimes. So that that's more of a behavioral thing because what would you do with the puppy who's now like, wait, every time I do this, she lets me out. Mm. Pretty soon you're letting that puppy out every 10 minutes because because that's what the puppy's trained you to do. Right. So that's kind of more of a behavioral thing. And so that's the loss of urinary, um, urine preceded by a strong urge. So it's not just when you're going to the bathroom, but if you get a strong, unexpected urge and leak. And that's usually, a lot of people also experience some urgency and frequency. So if you feel like you're not getting to the bathroom in time, what would be a really logical plan to manage that? You'd go more often. You're like, ooh. Maybe I need to not wait so long. But the thing is, is that then you're training yourself to go more often. Go more often. So Got even though it. your bladder is perfectly capable of holding more, that kind of sensitivity and those signals you're interpreting are like, ah, no, I should go now. Yeah. And then pretty soon you're that person who can't make it through a movie. You're that person who can't make it past a bathroom without needing to go. And you're the person that no one wants to go on a road trip with because you're stopping every like hour on the hour right? and every rest stop. But now, is that because your brain is interpreting this as such? Like, is it, I mean, I, I know that there is like a, a physical manifestation, obviously, but yeah. is that, like, have you trained your brain and, and to feel that way? Yeah. Or to interpret that as such? I would, I would say yes, because most of the time, even if it wasn't intentional, like, it, it's kind of like a slippery slope. It's like, ooh, I almost didn't make it that one time. I'm gonna plan ahead. And then what starts to happen, especially if you're like, all right, your bladder's filling up, you kind of feel like you need to go, and you go to the bathroom, and it came out. It's like, all right, so that was nice and normal. But then imagine that time where you're like, hold on, I almost didn't make it. 
but you were stretched this much. Mm -hmm. You're going to start going when the bat bladder stretched this much. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon, if you let it, so you're like, ooh, now I'm going down here. Now I need to go sooner. Mm -hmm. And this is what, one way you can tell this is happening. And it can happen sometimes without ending up with a diagnosis of urgency, frequency, or incontinence. But where you get to the bathroom and you feel like you've got to go, but then nothing happens. Tinkle. <laughs> like it's the smallest tinkle. And you're like, I thought I wasn't going to make it, but that's, uh, that's all that's in there. Yeah. And um, so that was like big urge, little output. That's kind of a mismatch. And that'll happen sometimes. But if mm -hmm. it's always like that, where you're only peeing like less than 100 milliliters, I'd have to convert it to ounces, sorry. But like if you're peeing less than that, that's not much more than your post void, than a nice healthy post void residual. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to empty at that point. If your bladder is saying, empty me now, and that's all that's in there. Yeah, so it's kind of like um, your, the sensitivity of your bladder has turned way up, just yes. like how we would compare that to, to pain. pain. Um, so the sensitivity has turned way up so that it takes less of a stimulus in the bladder itself to you know, trigger that feeling of you have to go, even though the bladder is barely full. Exactly. Got it. And there's actually some interesting conversations with um, is like urgency and frequency and that feeling of extreme urge, can that be considered a pain? And um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting conversation because mm -hmm. there, there is a normal sensitivity of normal urge, but when that urge becomes pathological, too, sim yeah, too, yeah. too bothersome, does that cross over into a distressing emotional experience? I would think so, yeah. Yeah. Like, can you imagine if you're like on a train or something like that, and you have to really, really, you have you're having that urge? I mean, that's very it's distressing. Very distressing. That's very distressing. That's like you're suffering. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And okay. So if you have someone like that, and what do what do you what do we have them do? So they keep a, a diary, which you can get on the home health section, and we'll yep. have a link to that in the show notes. Awesome. It's um, so you basically ask them to keep track of things for mm -hmm. a couple days. I tend to keep it simple with, and what are you drinking and when, and when when are you going to the bathroom? If people are willing to measure, that's the best, but not many people are willing to measure. Mm -hmm. So what I try to have them do is to, is to kind of come up with their own plan, and I tell them this is not exact science because you're not measuring, but that's okay because if you have a three urge, which is kind of a lot, but you have like a little tinkle, that's kind of a mismatch. If that only happens after your third mimosa, okay, we're, we're, that might actually be like a normal bladder thing. Um, do you know what I mean? So we kind of look at things that they're bringing in that may or may not be irritating to them. Um, we look at are they getting enough fluid, mm -hmm. and bladder loves, loves water, but what the first thing most people cut out if they're having urgency, frequency, or incontinence is water. Is they cut out their water. <laughs> or it'll, fluids. It'll almost always backfire, yeah. so don't do that, anyone watching. Um, it'll also make you constipated, which can increase your urgency and frequency. So, so yeah, so surprise, everything needs to work well to work well. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it, so you kind of look at that and you, I just look for patterns. And then I have people try to change one thing at a time. If all you're drinking is coffee all day, but actually you have good day, good parts of your day and bad parts of the day, is it the coffee? Because if you're drinking coffee all day, you're probably not going to be very nice to me if I say, how about you stop drinking coffee? Um, emotional response up. Um, so yeah, so you just kind of look at it. It's like, oh, when does this happen? Mm -hmm. What do we need to change? Mm -hmm. And it can really help you narrow down. Is it really urge incontinence? Is it actually just frequency and they're not leaking like they thought they were? Or, you know, is this primarily a, a stress incontinence issue? Okay. Well, so it sounds to me like there's not a lot of hands-on work there. No, no. It's and, more talking and, and it's education. it's more behavioral. Okay, yeah. great. So any questions on that? From anyone here? No? Yeah, Susan? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering, do you ever use pelvic... Oh, come over here. Do you ever use pelvic tilting to get the posterior versus anterior? I do. Yeah, so that's some neat work with, from Paul Hodge's group, um, where, and we can all kind of do it right now. So however you're sitting, most of us are slouchy, just do a pelvic floor contraction. However your brain tells you to do that, do it, and just feel where you feel it. But then if you get yourself in a situation where you like get more of that lumbar lordosis, and so like you stick your tail out, you get more lumbar lordosis, and then you do the exact same thing, so you're not changing your cue, for most people, it scoots to the front. 
And it's kind of neat because one of the things, one of my pet peeves is when, <laughs> we were talking about it earlier, is when pelvic floor therapists get tunnel vision and are just doing pelvic floor exercises but not reintegrating it into how they're, they're using their body. So if you have a runner who's a chronic butt tucker and she's leaking out of the front, obviously, how would it feel if you like got those glutes back a little bit? Because you can't run and Kegel at the same time. You can't, you can try. <laughs> It's not going to go well, um, and certainly not for like a 5K, let alone not a marathon. So changing how that is biased, because most of us don't think about our pelvic floors until you have a problem, right? But they've been working, right? They've been doing their thing. You're using them when you walk up those stairs. You're using them when you're getting up off the floor. So this isn't a matter of I have to Kegel so they do something. The Kegel is like your bicep curl. You want a stronger bicep, you're going to do some curls. You want a stronger pelvic floor, you're gonna have to do some pelvic floor exercises. Um, but that's not your management plan. You kind of wanna, someone said it yesterday, but like, um, but kind of like the core muscles, are they're like automatic. Like when you get ready to do something, you don't think, okay, transversus, obliques, we're good. <laughs> like it just all happens and you wanna kind of get the pelvic floor back into that system and make sure it's strong enough and coordinated enough to do its part so you don't think about it. Got it, all right. Is that Make sense? Okay, Dave, did you have a question? Just come on over. <laughs> so along those lines then, would you say that if somebody's more lordotic, they're more likely to engage the anterior floor and then flat back more at the posterior floor? Is that fair? That, that, that tends to be, that, yeah, that tends to be how, what, what they're finding on like EMG studies and what I will see clinically with people. If they do a ginormous butt tuck, um, one, if you do, it's really interesting if you're like, how's your breathing when you do that? And, and how good is your squat, let's say, when you do that? And it's like, ah, it is what it is. And like, okay, so what if we do kind of take it into where some people, especially if they've been told by other practitioners to like watch your lordosis, it's kind of huge, um, which isn't really a thing. Um, <laughs> but you know, they, they kind of, they're kind of like going in there, they're like, I'm so scared, but it kind of feels good. And then you have them do that movement or try that exercise. Usually they're like, that was way easier than I thought it was gonna be. But again, if it's not working, then we try something else because everyone's anatomy is different. Um, sometimes if they have a lumbar issue, getting into the ideal position for their pelvic floor may or may not be easy for them, at least at first. Um, but yeah, but I think you need to play around with how it feels and how it's functioning as opposed to, I mean, I've been guilty of it in my career, of like, ah, you need more or less of what you're doing with your spine and we're just different. So it's where it, where it works best is where it should be. Does that answer kind of? Good. Jamie, did you have a question? Yeah. So for a lot of the outpatient clinicians in orthopedic setting, there's still a, an emphasis on giving some kind of qualitative documentation to the muscle contraction, whether it's a manual muscle test or something like that for, for payment purposes. So what are some, some strategies or tips for, for clinicians to be able to take that palpation externally and then relate that into their strengthening documentation? Um, so if you're just checking externally, like just palpating outside, it's like a plus minus. Like, yep, I felt it, uh, they couldn't find it. Um, so kind of plus minus, because you can't give it more than that. Um, and we also have to remember, so when I write about pelvic floor strength, in my documentation I have a number I can put, and you can grade it, you have to do that internally, which is why if you're like, ah, we need to know more, refer them to a friend or go to the training. But um, but I usually give a lot more information. So like, all right, so they, you know, they had like a three out of four, three out of five squeeze. Um, the relaxation was not very coordinated and kind of slow, but then their subsequent contractions were five out of five. Or do you know what I mean? We have to, because of payment and insurance and all of those things, we have to write something down. So what I do is I write down what I find and I'm happy to talk about it. So if you want to deny it, I can talk vagina all day with you. And, <laughs> and I have, and their questions usually get shorter and shorter. Um, because really, they're asking for information that isn't necessarily the most helpful. So if you're checking externally, plus minus. But also I've had people who five out of five, but it's still incontinent. So then they're like, well, they're not weak, but you put down you're gonna do strengthening. I'm like, well, yeah, because it's more of a strengthening, not just a strengthening. With a, with a functional goal attached to that, if that makes sense. So I, sometimes it's more words, but uh, don't be shy about one, well, first of all, please be honest, be as accurate as you can be, but also don't be shy about 
doing the best care and be willing to stand up for it. If it gets denied, it's not because you gave crappy care, likely. I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how long you practice. Hopefully good. Um, but if, if you get denied, it's not necessarily because you gave bad care or even did a bad note. It's because they decided they weren't going to pay based on something, hopefully logical, that you can talk about. You can always appeal. Um, so yeah, so don't let, don't let payment scare you away from giving the best care. Another soapbox in my head. Yeah, no, great. Did anyone else have a question um, from anything that we talked about so far? No? Okay. okay. So, that, so it was urgent continence. Yeah, so, about stress incontinence. Yeah, so let's talk about that because I think that gets the more airtime, so to speak. So that's when you see the the crossfitters or the weightlifters yeah. or and they're oh, there's a great just, gymnast picture yesterday going backwards over were you there backwards over the the um, pommel horse uh -huh. but it's not the pommel horse the girls just it's the horse just a horse just a spurt like it was yeah and you're just like that could be photoshopped but also it probably isn't yeah or like we've all seen like the crossfit videos where you yeah. know women are peeing and then everyone high fives them because they worked so hard that they peed yeah. which you know, not normal, um, and we know that that's been addressed by a lot of uh, pelvic health physical therapists. So, I what I would like to know first give like I think we just gave the definition of stress incontinence, but I'll have you give the definition quickly. Um, but then I'd like to go back to something that the question that Dave had asked about the positioning and how that works within weightlifting or within you know weighted or loaded movements, but. Go ahead and give the definition of stress incontinence for a second. So stress incontinence is basically when there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure that is greater than the closure pressure of the urethra. Mm -hmm. And you have some sphincters as well as the pelvic floor helping keep all of that closed. But if you increase the pressure enough on the inside, then that's why you hear, and again, it's primarily women, but also a lot of men after prostate surgery, they cough and you get a spurt, or you, you, know, you, you jump and you feel it come out. Those are usually because the closer pressure has gone down or the intra-abdominal pressure has gone up. Okay, great. So now how does that, uh, what does that look like for the average physical therapist who's not a pelvic health therapist? Mm -hmm. And let's say they are seeing someone for hip pain mm -hmm. and they, and you ask them, are you ever incontinent? Or if they are, you know, heavy lifters or they are adding load and they say, oh yeah, but that's normal. Yeah. So, or they have low back pain and they say, yeah, but that's normal. Everybody does it at my CrossFit box or whatever, yeah. or at my gym. So how do you then, if you're not you, you're someone who's not a pelvic mm -hmm. health therapist, how do you address that? Uh, well, first of all, what all of us should know is that the, it, while incontinence is super common, it is not normal, not ever. Being dry is normal. Um, so... <laughs> So we need to get away Fair. from this idea that like, well, everyone's doing it. It's like, yeah, but do you, does that make you want to do it? Like, I feel like no. I feel like no is the answer. Um, so, so first of all, just and sometimes they don't know that. Like, I know that in some like young girl gymnastic teams, like the color of their leotards are chosen to like not show the pee um, because they're what? incontinent that young. Yeah, and I see a lot of women as adults sometimes before they've had babies, sometimes after. Right. So like, what's the what came first? But um, they've had lifelong issues with what's essentially pelvic floor issues with incontinence, sometimes pain with intercourse, all of those things. Competitive gymnasts, competitive cheerleaders, um, dancers tend to be probably the biggest. Um, runners are another, another group. There's been some studies. Uh, there's one study, and I cannot recall, I mean, it's probably like 15 years old now, where 100% of this Division I female track team reported urinary symptoms. hundred like every girl. So common, heck yeah, normal, not someone so needs much. to check those girls. <laughs> yeah. so, so the biggest thing if you're not a pelvic floor therapist is to check out their function. So if they can identify when they're having issues, it's when I get to this particular weight um, or it's when I get to mile 17. And I usually throw in, like, if I ran 17 miles, I'm not really sure what my body would do. <laughs> like, I'm, I don't know. But it still shouldn't leak. Um, so, but, but if you can find out where that breakdown in the coordination, in, in, the, in the endurance, in the strength, and okay. whatever it is, happens, 
and look at what's happening there. Because if you can run 17 miles or you can lift 200 pounds without leaking, but then you do, you're not, you're not weak, right? Like you, if you can do all of that, something's happening there to make this happen. So then you start looking at... Meaning weakness in that you don't have a weak pelvic floor. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, good point. Um, so, because if you can lift 200 pounds in that leak, something's working. Mm -hmm. It's just not still working when you try to lift 210. Okay. So let, let's look at what's changing. Right. Or a number of repetitions. Right. right. So right. you can do two or three, but then when you get to four or five, right. things start to happen, then... Okay. And, and then that's where you're looking. It's, I hope it's okay if I do some shout outs. Is mm -hmm. that like um, Julie Weave has some great wonderful, information wonderful on, stuff. Um, yeah. on just looking at, so like what happens? So if you collapse your chest, and which I would probably do after running 17 miles, and I'm like this, and now what happens when I collect, uh, what happens to my bottom half when I collapse my shoulders? Well, my butt just tucked because um, I'm just trying to get through. Now, the funny thing is, is breathing is also harder. So while I'm doing this as kind of a mechanism to keep going, I'm also. It's harder to breathe because and it's nothing's harder for the diaphragm well. to have a full excursion. Right. Yeah. So, so I like to look at if you're running fine for 17 miles, I want to see you at mile 16. I want to see what's changing over that mile. And I want to see what you look through mile 18. And can you, when you start to get to that point, can you make an effort to change something? Do you notice a change in your breathing when you're lifting 210 instead of 200? And kind of look at it from that way, because you're not going to kegel while you do that. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, and some people will say to like pre-contract and prime and all these things, and, and that's fine, but especially like if we go back to the running, you're not kegeling all that time. You, your pelvic floor after like 30 seconds is like, dude, you don't want me to get that tired. Like mm -hmm. it's going to be like, we're mm -hmm. going to stop that now. So yeah, so the way I would approach that if you're not me <laughs> yes. and, and not going to do a vaginal exam is you look at their performance. So if they said, I have knee pain when I do this, when I go from 200 to 210, you my would squat. Look at how they you do would their look squat. at the mechanics. You would look at what's happening. What is different? Because you know the joint can do it. Mm -hmm. You know the muscles can do it. What's changing? Um, and you would address that. So okay. it's it's really no different. If they can tell when they're leaking, you're just looking what can what are the things that can change it. Okay. Usually the tail lift and looking at their breathing are two really easy ways to go about it. Okay. All right. That's great. And 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 that goes with uh, the. Does that also um, work with, let's say, instead of you're not a runner or a weightlifter, but you're like a new mom or something like that, and you're okay, but then by the end of the day, after you've been maybe lifting the baby or you know doing wh whatever you're doing, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be sport related. Is Correct. What I'm it, I think about it like function, but definitely. Well, I mean, you asked about the. I was like, oh, wow. but, but yeah, but no, just every day. If getting out of a chair makes you leak, mm -hmm. that's but then it's basically a squat. So you are you're looking at the activity that Got they're it. having difficulty with, and making small changes. Got in it. most in most cases. So I think the biggest takeaway here for me is that not everything is solved by doing a kegel. Correct. <laughs> um, and and I think a lot of non pelvic health PTs may have that that misconception that if someone has incontinence, well, Kegel time, right? Well, that's all you most, gotta do. That's what most people do if they go to the doctor and they mention it. It's like, ah, eh, you know, that's pretty normal. It's not, it's common. <laughs> and then they'll be like, do some Kegels. And, and a lot of women and men don't know how to do them. So then they're just like, I'm squeezing stuff and like Kegels <laughs> didn't work. And it's like, well, before we get too far, can we check and see how you're doing them? Yeah. And I think that's um, kind of a beautiful segue. So let's say you have your new mom or you have your athlete or whatever, and you are, um, you've tried some stuff, right? Because none of this is life or death, right? I mean, it's fine to try some things. They're already not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So trying to change up a couple things is perfectly within your purview, especially again, if you're seeing them for hip or low back, it all it's all together, mm -hmm. you're good. But if it's not changing, if it's not getting better, if when you ask them, you know, can you contract your pelvic floor, what do you feel? They're like, I got no idea. And they're like, but please also don't touch me there. Or, or you touch them there and you're like, yeah, I don't feel anything either. <laughs> and I've used all my cues, but I don't know what to do. That's when you refer. Because just like any other thing somebody's coming to see you for as a physical therapist, you're going to do some things. And if those things are not working or they're getting worse, you're going to try something different or call the doctor or refer to a friend, mm -hmm. right? So if, they, if you've changed some things and you're like, yeah, I'm amazing, they're all better, 
awesome. Do they need to go to pelvic floor therapy? I'd say no, if their incontinence resolves or their pain resolves. But, um, but sometimes with, especially, we see it a lot more in, um, in the, I would say the more active athletic population, is a pelvic floor that's more like this. So it's like tense. tense. Yeah. tense. Okay. Um, and there's a hundred, like people call it hypertonic or high tone or short pelvic floor and all these things. And, and basically in my brain, the way I categorize it is like, you should be able to contract your pelvic floor and you should be able to let it go. Mm -hmm. And we could all get better at that. But if you're like, I'm here, how good is my contraction gonna be? Because I'm not showing you my pelvic floor. Like it's not gonna, it's gonna test right. maybe Got weak. It. It's gonna not move very much. But if you get them to relax more, or they're like, oh, I didn't know that was there. Huh, that's better. Then you all of a sudden you have a good contraction. How do they relax? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Do you just say relax? There's a couple. Like nobody no, in the history of no, the world I, ever the worst, relaxed I, when somebody tells them to relax. I think the worst thing to do is be like, can you just relax? relax so it. I try to have them feel the difference between contracting and not contracting. Because what will happen, and people use it with the traps all the time, is like, so like, ah, you know, so much tension. All right, again, telling you to relax your shoulders. Thanks, I didn't think of that. Um, <laughs> but if you squeeze and let go, like it's a little bit of like, oh, I feel that, oh, oh, there's some more space there. Mm -hmm. So I start with that, okay. with the pelvic floor. But again, if they're like, I just don't know, um, that's something that is so easy to feel with a vaginal or rectal exam. Okay. So that's where it's like, ah, you're having some trouble. I would recommend, would you see my friend for one visit, have this exam, they're checking out your muscles, and um, you know, just see if they can feel that relaxation, and then come up with like cueing or a plan that works for them. Okay. Because it, it's not just about like slapping everything out. It's mm -hmm. really feeling that the relaxation, that yeah. lengthening of the muscles there. Yeah, okay. and, and being intentional about it. You don't want to lie there and hope. Like <laughs> maybe it'll let go at some point. Uh -huh. Like that's that how it works. Work. All that's right. Works. Well, that would be easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh well. Um, does anyone have any questions on on any of that? Any? Jake? Yeah. You come on. Here. Hold like, on a second. Oh. Here, I'll come over to you. There you go. So you talked about tingling, and what about dosage or prescription quality versus quantity, and how you prescribe that to your patients? Great question. Um, there, there is no hard and fast rule as to like how many, how much. So that's where, again, I would have them do some and see how their coordination goes, because if they're otherwise neurologically intact and they're kind of getting it, how many do they need to do? I would say it's not unreasonable to go kind of basic strength and conditioning principles of, you know, like, I don't know, eight to 12 reps, three times a day. That's, a, that's an okay starting point. Um, and actually, I don't know if you know this. So I'm writing a book on incontinence and the um, OPT if you will have it, but it's, it, the editor just asked me, she's like, well, since we don't have like a hard and fast number, do we, should we put that in there? And I said, I think we do. So that's a good starting point. Not everyone would be able to do that right off the bat, but also some people will be able to do that and they're not getting better. So it's kind of like, let's start here and see what happens. And then you can kind of like titrate it up and down. If I do an exam on somebody and they can't contract for 10 seconds, they can only contract for five, I'm not gonna have them contract for 10 seconds at home. I would probably, honestly, in that case, have them go, I need you to make sure you can feel the good contraction. So you actually also asked about quantity and quality. I want quality, because um, all of us can do 100 crappy ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how much that would help. So really looking to be like, okay, so I feel that contraction and I'm breathing. And I usually, actually I've stopped counting seconds. I've had people go by breath. So if you, let's do it. We're gonna squeeze our pelvic floors and you're just gonna keep squeezing as you breathe in and breathe out normally, nothing, nothing fancy, and then keep squeezing while you breathe in, and breathe out, and let go. And what I hope you felt was a squeeze to start with, maintaining the squeeze. Some people will feel kind of like a little, a little wave as they breathe, which is not unusual, but then when you stop the breathing and you let go, you should feel that let go. So if you didn't feel that let go, I usually say that's one of two things, without feeling, right? I can't tell without feeling, is that you got tired, and, it, and you lost it, or you forgot to let go. So that's okay, have a wiggle, reset, and try it again. Because if you're not feeling the contraction, what are you doing? Like, you might as well take a walk, because then you'll actually be using your pelvic floor. Um, 
Yeah. So, so yeah. And I like going with the breath because a lot of people like to hold their breath when they're mm. like, they'll do like the, like, like they'll just suck it in and it, you'll feel a lift, but it's just a vacuum. <laughs> it's, it's not really your muscles doing their thing. Mm. So by doing the breathing, um, if you breathe in and out twice, nice and slow, it's 10 seconds. You don't even have to count. So if I have you do four of those, you just have to like count on your fingers, two breaths, come in a rest for two breaths. So much easier to keep track of. Great. And then people actually do them. Because if I tell them to do 10 second holds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> done. And that's not really helpful either. So like the two slow breaths, now you're breathing and don't have to count and you're gonna stay honest. Yeah, great question. Oh, Shelly's watching. Hi Shelly, I haven't even looked at who's watching. Hi everyone. So trying to bring this into the neuro world, um, for someone who's post-stroke and has stress incontinence, or they've had um, neural damage of some sort and have stress incontinence, are there any PNF techniques where you can incorporate the pelvic floor um, to help with that? I so I haven't had PNF stuff since college, um, and I'm old. So what I would say is, is if I'm recalling that they go through movement patterns, and as you're doing those things, there things will be happening in the pelvic floor. It seems to make sense. Um, what specifically, I don't know, but if you're kind of working more with that tone in general, I've only had a couple of patients come see me, um, like post CVA, and feeling their pelvic floors is amazing because while it makes perfect sense that one side might be like hypertonic or non-functioning, until you feel it, it's like, wow, that's so cool. Like one side totally normal, springy, they can track and relax the other side, just like their, their hemiparetic arm. It's cool. Um, with, with stuff like CVAs or neurological involvement, you really want to make sure you're on board with the physicians and you know that bladder function is, is still intact. Because depending on where the stroke is and, and, and what exactly happened or where the spinal cord injury is, um, you don't want to mess around with screwing up the bladder or the kidneys. So if they're not going to the bathroom or they're only leaking during transfers, that could be stress incontinence or it could be overflow incontinence because their bladder is so distended with the effort. So that's something you would really want to make sure you talk with the, the their nurse or their um, their attending physician and make sure. So how are things working? Because the other thing we need to remember is a lot of things are still working on people who had neurological insults, right? So once you're like, okay, bladder is relaxing as it fills, contracting as it empties, it's emptying fine, we're not worried about this being overflow incontinence, I would actually start to incorporate stuff like blow before you go, thanks Julie, and um, stuff like that where you're managing it the same way you would for someone not having a stroke. But half of that, the being continent and actually going to the bathroom, it seems, I can make it sound very simple, but I have a slide in a course that I teach where it has all the, like the tracks up to the brain and the, um, to uh, all the tracks to the spinal cord, to the bladder, but we got the sphincters, we got the detrusor. All of this stuff just happens. And when I click the slide from this beautiful, simple picture, it just gets it. It's just font about this big, explaining all of the complex things that are happening so far as we know. So again, as long as their um, bladder is functioning on that basic level, where it's, it knows when to empty and it can empty, I would treat them like uh, anyone else and not assume that it's just because of a high tone pelvic floor on that one side that's the issue. But if you get that person and you do your PNF, please tell me what happens and if it changes their incontinence. I would really like to know. And when you're looking at the bladder function, that is something the physician is doing like through an ultrasound? Is that how that um, works? How do they do that? They can do it through an ultrasound so that, that there they can look mostly at like post void residual. Mm -hmm. But then also there's a test called neurodynamics. And this is a test that <laughs> involves um, ca a catheter and the urethra and then a probe in another orifice down there to help measure for um, intra-abdominal pressure. And it's kind of a neat test. If someone wanted to do it on me for free, I would probably do it. But um, they're also looking at um, EMG the whole time. So they start to fill up your bladder with saline so you know how much is in there. And, and you're awake for this test because they go, tell us when you, when you feel the first urge to go. And they mark where that is. And so you can see how much fluid is in there. And they're like, tell us when you get, like, the, I, I should go to the bathroom now urge. And they mark that. And then they're like, okay, tell us when you can't take it anymore. <laughs> and they mark that. So then they know how much your bladder can truly hold. 
but also looking at what's your detrusor doing, um, which is the smooth muscle around your bladder, what's happening to your pelvic floor, where is the weakness, and usually when they're full, sometimes I'll have people cough to see if, if anything leaks or if any sphincters happen, um, or sphincters, uh, what they're up to, but it's, it's involved, but there's a lot of good information. An interesting side note is that if you do, so that's really, I think really helpful for like a neurologic population, just to make sure. I did have one patient, um, I was lucky enough to work with a PT who became a physiatrist who specialized in neurogenic bowel and bladder. And she let me come down to, to watch the aerodynamics of one of my patients who was really against capping. He didn't want to cap. So she came down, she brought him down to the aerodynamics and as it, and because he's like, I am voiding 400 to 600 milliliters every time I have a bowel movement. And like, that's pretty good. I mean, like most bladders are four to 600 cc's. And turns out it was only under very high pressure. He was already getting reflex into his kidneys. And after he voided four to 600 cc's, he still had four to 600 left, which is too much. So, um, so even though he was having some output, that was the test that really made it clear to him like, oh, it's coming out, but it's not healthy. Like I need to be at. So yeah, so right. neurodermis, but on a, on a population that hasn't had a neurological issue, or there's no other worries, avoiding law can tell you almost that much. Great, great. And we have time for one more question. Jamie, do you have a question? And then we'll wrap it up. So just real quick, what are some of the considerations that you might go through in your thought process when you're dealing with a male versus a female pelvic pain or incontinence issue? Yeah, that's a quick question. <laughs> so long, I could talk for days on that. Um, Teaser uh, question. Well, I'm not sure. Like, yeah, tease, tease it out. <laughs> when you're talking about considerations, um, I, I really do, I really do think that um, we need to take into consideration our, our patient preference and what they're comfortable with. We can tell when our patients are uncomfortable, or we should be able to. Um, but then, kind of try to work out. They might not want to talk to me about this, but who can I get that they would? Because a lot of people would assume that men aren't really comfortable talking to females, but a lot of the men who come to see me just want help. Um, and we've had several male students come through Entropy, and you know they run into like women not wanting a male therapist to do it. Um, so so there's there's that part. It's just finding that right, just like any other body part, finding the right person to help. But then if we go to you know bringing up those subjects, um, I don't know that. It, in my brain, it's so, so different, male to female. You're, you're gonna take into consideration their history, for sure. Um, especially, and I feel happy saying that because now with, we have, have kind of like a gender spectrum, right? We have people who, who have transitioned in varying degrees, and we have people who haven't transitioned but totally identify with, with the gender they weren't assigned at birth, and all of these things. So basically, I take it like functional. So can you just walk me through the issues you're having, your questions, concerns, um, when it's a problem, if anything makes it better, does anything in particular make it worse, and then we problem solve from there. Um, so I, so I guess I don't really have a good, a good answer, male to female. I just, their situations are usually different, but it's kind of different across one gender or the other anyway. Is that kind of yeah. the answer? Yeah, okay. great question. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we covered a lot, and I thank you guys for being here, for and I hope that you guys got a lot out of this and can kind of take this back to your patients now. Um, so last question is uh, that I ask everyone, and it's what, at, so knowing where you are now in your life and your career, what advice would you give to yourself as a new grad? Uh, ask more questions. To be honest, um, I came out of school pretty much like, like the teachers know best, and, and and what I learned is is the right is right. And then when you get into the real world, I ended up thinking I was not very good at my job for a while, <laughs> because like you would do what you were taught to do, but it wouldn't work. And then you know some things happen, and I got older and more comfortable. And when you start asking questions, you realize there isn't one answer. Um, so if you start asking those questions, you're part of you're part of the solution. Um, by, by kind of pushing those boundaries and not, like I wish I would have just asked more questions sooner. I'd be so much smarter than I am now. I mean, hard to do. Um, <laughs> hard to You're do, sweet. hard to do. Well, where can people find you on social media if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, Sarah Haig PT on Twitter. Um, you can find me on my website, um, www.entropy.physio. 
and um, I mean Facebook Sarah Haig I don't know what my picture looks like right now but um, I'm friends with Karen so if it says I'm friends with Karen that's probably me <laughs> that would be the right one <laughs> awesome and just so that everyone knows a lot of the stuff that Sarah spoke about we will have links to it we'll have links to the home health section we'll have links to the the testing, the urogenic testing, is that? Oh, neurodynamic? Neuro neurodynamic testing. Um, you can just send me a link or something about okay. it. So we'll have all of that in the, it. yeah, you can Google it, but we'll <laughs> have it all in the show notes at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. Thanks everyone for watching the Thank live. You. We appreciate it. And everybody, thanks for listening. Have a great couple of days. Stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Finish. Save recording. Well, thanks everybody for watching. We hope you liked it. And what's so weird is like Susan and Jamie are watching online, but they're also here. I was like, this is so meta. So everybody, thanks so much. Bye.